Learning Revolution presents the Emergency Home Learning and More Summit. And in this session, Flipping the Classroom, now more important than ever, I, Kate Baker, will be sharing with you strategies for implementing flipped learning during this time of distance and hybrid education. I am the Senior Community Engagement Manager at Edmodo. I'm also a veteran of the classroom. I taught freshman English for 20 years, and I'm on the board of the Flip Learning Network. And when I taught in the classroom, I flipped my classes for um, a good eight plus years, and I continue to use flip learning techniques with professional development. So let's begin. First off, we need to start with the definition of flipped learning because there's a lot of things out there that try to say what flipped learning is. And according to the Flipped Learning Network, it is a pedagogical approach in which direct instruction moves from the group learning space to the individual learning space. And that resulting group space is transformed into a dynamic, interactive learning environment where the educator guides students as they apply the concepts and engage creatively in the subject matter. So it's definitely more than just watching videos. So while many folks do flip some of the instruction in order to engage in flipped learning, which is a little bit different than a flipped classroom, we want to dive deeper into this definition. So first off, let's take a look at the timing because this is definitely going to impact the learning that's happening, whether you're at home or you're in the school space. And no matter your location, I want you to think about learning in terms of synchronous and asynchronous timing. So in a synchronous setting, learners meet in real time, we follow a predetermined meeting schedule and we utilize face-to-face -face interactions and video conferencing for that synchronous experience, no matter where in the world we may be located. And then in an asynchronous learning environment, we, learners will work independently on a schedule. They will have predetermined workflow and deadlines, and you will utilize flipped learning and asynchronous communication tools. So you're not always meeting face-to-face. -face. Now you can do both, and this is what flipped learning is taking a look at, how you can make the synchronous group space be very dynamic and engaging and supported by the work that folks are doing in the asynchronous learning space. So if we think about this in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, traditionally Bloom's is shown here as this pyramid where the foundation is remembering and understanding and then we move up that hierarchy to evaluate and create so in a traditional teacher-centered learning model that individual space from our flipped learning definition is where students would engage in the creation the evaluation and the analysis work as they independently complete homework and projects and then our group space is where the teacher is synchronously introducing new material to the students via direct instruction so they, they can practice the foundational skills of applying, understanding, and remembering the content that they are learning. And in a flipped classroom, you'll see that this is now flopped, flip-flopped. <laughs> we have the group space is where we will be doing the create, evaluate, and analyze. And then the individual space is where students are learning that new material via video or an ed tech tool. And if we think about this too, um, and aligning with blooms with the um, hierarchy, and this synchronous and asynchronous timing. If we also flip blooms to reflect the time that we wanna spend on these materials. So yes, remembering and understanding are definitely foundational skills. And we want those things to occur asynchronously at in individual and small group learning activities. But where we wanna spend the majority of our time with our students and our learners is in this synchronous class no, you could also do this with small groups, space of doing application, creation, evaluating, and analysis. And we always want to have that bridging of the 
the lower to upper blooms by continually applying that new info that they are learning. Now, this can all be, you know, kind of tough to remember. So the Flip Learning Network has uh, created this acronym, FLIP, and the four pillars of flip learning to help us better understand how we can implement flip learning in our classroom spaces and beyond. So flip learning requires the F of flexible environment. The learning space needs to accommodate a variety of students and choosing when and where and how they will learn. And we wanna be flexible not only in the physical location of where students are working, but also in our timelines and expectations for how students are assessed. The L in our flipped learning pillars is learning culture. So we want students to be part of a student-centered learning experience, and we want to use student-centered pedagogy in the learning that is happening. We want our students to have that autonomy and responsibility and accountability for the work that we're doing. And we can do this by using the eye of intentional content that flipped educators continually think about how they are teaching their students and providing them with conceptual understanding and procedural fluency. And that again, we're using a number of different active learning strategies to keep them engaged. And then we also want to do with the P is being a professional educator that as educators, we don't just sit back and kick our feet up and open up our newspaper as the kids watch a video. No, instead, we are continually observing the students. We are providing them with relevant feedback and assessing their work. And we are re continually reflective in our practices and helping students you know, come to fruition with the things that they are trying to accomplish. And as professional educators, we always want to be connected to a greater community of learning where we are engaged in our own professional development to improve, again, the learning outcomes that are happening in our classroom spaces. So flipped learning is really easy to implement and track on Edmodo uh, because we can do a flexible learning environment with Edmodo's classes and small groups. We can also engage students and foster that rich learning community using polls and polls, posts and wellness checks. We can deliver intentional content found in Discover and assess learning with a quiz or an assignment. And we can be part of that greater global community of professional educators and continue the conversation in community groups and with hashtags on Edmodo. So if you're wondering, gee, wait a second, Baker, what is Edmodo? Well, Edmodo is a communication and collaboration platform. It is above and beyond what uh, you can do with a learning management system because Edmodo can be the hub of your community's learning. We have powerful tools for collaboration and we have a great team of uh, support folks as well as our greater global community of educators who can assist and help and again, help us be better together. And Edmodo um, is a global platform. We have 190 active countries, 144 million registered users, and you know we're proud to be recognized by UNESCO and to work with uh, countries such as Egypt, um, Ghana, the state of Vermont and Hawaii, as well as you know individual districts like Miami-Dade. So let's go back to this flip learning definition and let's take a deeper dive into transforming the group space into a dynamic and interactive learning environment. So in looking at this pillar of flip learning, the flexible environment, we want to have that variety of learning modes. We want to arrange our space to facilitate the learning that's happening. We want to provide students with choice for when and where to learn and Students can flip in class. So the video doesn't have to happen at home. It can happen in the classroom space. If you, the teacher, are dedicating time for students to be able to watch those videos on their personal devices. 
And we also want to be flexible with our timelines for completion of work. Now, pre-COVID, I would, you know, move my furniture around um, in my classroom space to accommodate the learning activities that are happening. And, you know, collaboration is really uh, important. And we can even use things like windows, you know, take a whiteboard marker and write on windows for notes or even white writing on a desktop uh, to, you know, engage in this flexible environment. So there's a lot of ways that we can be flexible. Now, again, with COVID, we do have to keep in mind, um, you know, social distancing and, you know, sanitation. So, you know, would students necessarily be this close writing on windows and then using their personal devices to snap their notes? No, but I think we can adapt this for COVID and social distancing that's happening. So if we also want to think about how else we can make this flexible, engaging classroom space, we can turn to social and emotional learning. The Castle organization out of Chicago has come up with these five core competencies that help educators uh, align their learning activities with social and emotional learning. So if we want to think about ways that we can help students manage themselves, be self-aware, that they have social awareness, they're practicing relationship skills and responsible decision-making. And this is something that we want to build into our learning culture and do all the time, not just for a once in a while special project. So we can leverage the power of Edmodo's classroom tools with polls and wellness checks and posts and comments and quizzes and assignments and gamified jumpstart activities and even happy, not perfect mindfulness integration. So first off, I want you to think about, you know, again, with this flexible learning environment, how you can best organize your students to create that class PLN experience. So what I do is I name my classes in Edmodo with the school year. I create a class for each um, for each section that I teach. So you could do a class for each period or you could add all of your class periods of the same level to an Edmodo class. So and this would provide students with a channel for communication and some online personal learning networking experience where they are interacting with students they might not necessarily see face to face. And if you are on a hybrid schedule where half your students are in school and half of them at home, by having one location where they're all together, this can help build that sense of community when they can't see each other face to face, but they can comment and like and post to the class. Plus, this also saves you time as an educator to post once to one class instead of doing, you know, one post to five different classes. Well, let's work smarter, not harder. So in terms of what are we posting to our classes, I recommend posting the daily agenda that includes a welcoming message. So you can, you know, say hello to your students. You provide the objectives for the day's lesson. You list out the tasks they are to complete and provide the resources and links to those posts and definitely include timelines for when you want things to be turned in. And, you know, on Edmodo, it's so easy to be able to do this and to direct students where you want them to go because every post on Edmodo has a unique URL. So if you click on that ellipsis menu in the corner of a post of a quiz or an assignment, you will get this unique URL that you can then link into, you know, like an agenda post here so that you can direct students easily and efficiently to the tasks you want them to do in the individual as well as group learning space. Yeah, and being able to allow students to comment and post uh, is really great. We can see here that like Christopher has replied to Mr. Roosevelt's reminder to study and he's shared a link to Quizlet note cards and then his classmates are really appreciative of being able to um, utilize that resource. And then while this image here isn't animated, you can also reply to Edmodo posts with um, images and with GIFs so that you can add a little bit of visual interest uh, and some delight 
to your classroom spaces. And you can easily check in with your students via polls and wellness checks. So polls in Edmodo, the teacher is able to customize the question and the answer choices, and students are able to anonymously vote for their response. And then we get to see the whole class data uh, as to the selections that the students have made. This is great for if you want to do, you know, a quick check in on did they understand the material or if you want to ask a question as an uh, do now entrance ticket or as an exit ticket to get the students understanding. You can also do a wellness check and this tool is designed to allow you to quickly check in with your students that you get um, the question is the same for all wellness checks. How are you feeling today? And then the responses are pre-populated and then students can vote and select which one that they're feeling for today. Now the whole class can see who's voted, uh, you know, as a group, we can see the collective data, but only the teacher and the co-teacher in the class can see exactly who individually voted for, you know, I'm great, I'm okay, I'm meh, or I'm struggling. And then the teacher can do a follow-up uh, with a direct message in Edmodo to check in with that student and to build again that sense of connection. So let's again take a look at how we're not only organizing the space but what our interaction will be in this learning environment because we don't want students to just have faces and screens you know they're just watching a video they're just you know, posting and clicking and typing things. We want it to be dynamic and interactive. So this requires us to take a really close look at the learning culture. The learning culture needs to be student-centered. We need to focus on active learning strategies. So it's not just stare at a screen and drool for a video. We want to have students engaged in the learning and being kinesthetic and active in what they're um, application of the material. We also want them to be metacognitive or that they are reflecting and thinking about their processes as they're doing it. We want to support curiosity and inquiry based learning. And we also want to be supportive of those higher order thinking skills um, and social emotional learning on an ongoing basis, not just once in a while. So we can align this with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this gives us a really easy framework for understanding our students' uh, behavior and their motivation. So, you know, in short, Maslow determined that um, in order to get up to higher level thinking and to feel that we are part of something greater than ourselves, we first have to have our lower level needs met first. So if we have to go to the bathroom or if we're hungry, we are not gonna be able to focus on higher cognitive thinking tasks or be motivated to do things if those needs are not fulfilled first. But this requires an ongoing evaluation. We, you know, we know this, like if I get hungry, you know, and I eat something now, okay, my need has been met, but then in an hour or two hours, I'm going to be hungry again, and we'll need to refuel before I continue with the learning. So this requires us to do the same thing with our students. We need to constantly allow ourselves and each other to evaluate and make sure our needs are being met. And we can also look at this in terms of digital learning needs. So we know we can't do any integration of technology if we don't have the physical hardware, we don't have the internet, the Wi-Fi, uh, we don't have battery. We also cannot engage in digital learning successfully without our safety needs being met, that we need to teach digital citizenship, we need filters and safe searches and firewalls so that as educators, we can spend the majority of our energy and time in creating these spaces where students feel that they belong to something greater than themselves and that they feel good about the learning that is happening there. And we can do this by utilizing groups and creating a learning community and then supporting those interactions with badges and grades and comments and awards so that we can get our students to a space where they feel intrinsically motivated, they realize their talents, and they want to do the learning that we're doing in these spaces.
Now, in terms of the group space, we also have to think about collaboration and our needs for collaboration. So again, if we don't have the actual people to collaborate with, we're not going to be able to collaborate. We also need to have our safety needs of protocols and norms so that we can collaborate efficiently and effectively. And then again, focusing on belonging and esteem, we need to do the team building, the peer mentorship, the modeling, and provide feedback and accolades and recognition and affirmation. So that again, we feel good about this group space that we're learning in, and we want to continue and are motivated to continue the learning that's going on. So some fun things that we can do in Edmodo to help support this. Well, one easy strategy is to create a class banner. So in Edmodo, um, you can really easily uh, customize and personalize the virtual space by doing a class banner, and you can easily change this out. Um, you know, if you want to do a happy birthday message or if you want to do, you know, a seasonal theme, you can do that very easily. And we can also, as part of this flexible learning environment, is look at uh, Edmodo small groups for sharing spaces to support that learning culture. So within your Edmodo classes, you can create an, any number of small groups, and you can also customize who you want to add to those small groups. So you can differentiate instruction by adding um, specific individual students, or you could add your entire class to a small group. So in this case, I've created a small group called Share Our Work. The name is very intentional here. The pronoun of our is meant to build that sense of community. And so students, when they turn in their work um, to me as the teacher, I also ask them to do a copy of their assignment to our group sharing space so that the learning is visible, so that students can have that social awareness and see the things that each other are creating. And when you're doing fun, visual, digital learning assignments like vision boards or one word graphics, when you share them in this group space, you're really livening up that class stream. Uh, and it allows, again, students to see the creativity of their classmates and they can now like and they can comment and support the efficacy of learning that is happening. And it's so simple too, a real easy trick is that when your students are posting and you're allowing them to comment and like on each other's posts, you could reply with uh, like a digital sticker by attaching a JPEG, a PNG, or a, a GIF file. So you can really easily liven up and provide that sense of delight in that classroom online learning space. Okay, so we've looked at the second or the middle part of the definition of flip learning from our flip learning network. Let's take a look at the beginning, the pedagogical approach in which direct instruction moves from group learning to individual learning spaces. All right, so what does this mean? So with intentional content, we can foster conceptual understanding, we can Re, uh, require an ongoing evaluation of our materials and resources. We can maximize our class time in order to adopt various methods of instruction. And we can use tools, uh, both ed tech and videos, to help students meet their learning goals. And it's real easy to attach a video to an Edmodo post, you know, that you can direct students to watch the video. Um, you know, that you're modeling a process and that they are engaging in the learning. So when it comes to creating your flipped videos, I have, I have some words of advice. First off, you wanna keep the videos short. The general rule of thumb is one minute per grade level. So if you teach ninth grade, you know, nine minutes is the max that your video should be. Um, I tend, I believe that, and so do many other flip learning educators, that less is definitely more. So if you can stay like around five minutes, and then if you need to create a longer video, we'll chunk that content and create a series, do a playlist. Studies have shown that in terms of viewership, that uh, in comparing one 15 minute video to three five minute videos, 
there was greater viewership and more successful viewership when students watched the three five minute videos versus the 115. Now, in terms of equipment, when you're creating these flip videos, you definitely need a quiet area. You need a good microphone. Good lighting is also important. If you can have a window in front of you, you want to avoid any backlighting. You can also invest in tools like a light ring to um, attach to your computer to make it, you know, um, more vibrant. And uh, you definitely need a computer. You can also use a tablet, a document camera, or your cell phone to record your video. And there's so many free tools out there. You have Screencastify, the Chrome extension. Uh, there's Loom. There are other paid um, software that you can use to record. But, you know, just even simply using your cell phone camera can be an effective way to record a video. You definitely also want to have a cloud storage site like Google or uh, Google Drive um, or YouTube where you can save and upload that video file so it's not kept on the hardware of your computer. And in terms of visuals, you want to repurpose your existing materials. You know, you don't have to start everything over from scratch. Repurpose the PowerPoint slides if you've used for live lectures. Um, pull up the worksheet that you plan on um, you know having students complete all of those things are options and one thing you also want to think about doing with your videos is teaching your students how to watch a flipped video this is really important you might think well duh students can watch videos all the time kids watch videos all the time netflix and binge yeah but when you're watching a video for educational purposes you can pause it, you can rewind it, you can rewatch it, you can slow it down, you can speed it up, so you can customize uh, the viewing experience. And this is really, really important to teach students how to do this, because they might just be like, yeah, five minute video, I watched it, I'm done. But really, if they take the time to pause it, write down their notes or do whatever active learning is happening, it will extend that five minute video into a 10, 15 minute, 20 minute lesson. So let's take a little deeper dive into using the video and where the video can be inserted in the learning cycle. Because a video could be in the beginning of the learning cycle where the teacher is delivering and modeling instruction with screencasts and other tech tools. The students could watch the video at home or in class. You complete those tasks to demonstrate learning and understanding based on the viewing of the video. And then the emphasis is on the best use of face-to-face -face time with the class. So after you've watched this video modeling this process, now come into the group space and let's do an activity where we're applying or creating with that information that we've learned. And this learning model is called Flip 101, where you're just replacing that direct instruction with a video. Now, Another model of flipped learning is explore, flip, apply. And this is more inquiry based. So the teacher would provide students with organized, curated resources where the students are exploring and constructing their learning. And then the teacher will look for the holes in their learning, look for the areas where they need to supplement and provide additional direct instruction. And then the teacher will make a video to insert, and that will be the flip for that portion. And then they apply what they've learned from both the exploration phase and the flip phase to a project and assessment. Now, Explore Flip Apply is great to use uh, to support students, but it can take multiple days to complete the learning cycle. And if you're making videos on the fly to support what your students need in the moment, uh, that can be time consuming. So you just have to be good with your skill set of creating videos. Now, what you could also do is combine both Explore Flip Apply and Flip 01, 101 for a flip mastery approach. And what this requires is that you're, you have your whole unit figured out ahead of time and planned. 
You have predetermined levels of proficiency that your students must access. And you take your course, your unit, you divide it up into chunks, and the students must attain that level of proficiency before they can move on to the next topic or course or, or module within that greater unit. Now, this provides students with um, the opportunity to control the pace within a predetermined like window or timeline. And you can focus on content and meeting standards. And this frees this teacher from the front of the classroom and is now able to really be a facilitator of the learning. Now, Mastery Flip does require, though, a lot of work up front before you implement. And it requires you to be really strategic in how you are managing your students' workflow and being organized in tracking their learning. So if you're just getting started with Flip Learning, I recommend Flip 101 and Explore Flip Apply. And once you really become proficient, then you can take a deeper dive with Mastery Flip. All right, so now to review flipped learning and intentional content, you want your students to watch and interact with some sort of teacher created or curated videos and tools. You then want them to check their understanding with formative assessments. So verifying that they've understood the information and these uh, formative assessments to make things easier for educators, they should be things that can be automatically graded and scored and to make it clear for students if they're understanding the information that it is that feedback to the students is automatically delivered as well uh, for their performance. And then we want them to apply the things that they've learned to hands-on collaborative activities. So when you're designing an effective flip lesson, I want you to think of before, during, and after the video. What do you want students to do as a group or individually before they watch or engage in the flipped content? What do you want students to do during the video lesson? So while they are watching, what should they be doing? And then after the video lesson, how should they be engaging with that flip content as well? And keeping this in mind with the learning cycle, where is the video inserted in the learning cycle? And what do you want them to do before, during, and after? So in thinking about this, where can videos fit? They can fit in anywhere. You can have, starting with acquiring new information, you can make a video for direct instruction where you're modeling a process or you're, you're giving them information about it. You could also do a video for a check for understanding by creating an answer key video where you're asking, you know, you have your students do a worksheet and then in, you create a video that gives them the answers to the that activity. And what's great about that type of video is if you save it to um, Google or you save it to YouTube, you can change the video permissions that you can, you know, make it private when it comes time for that summative assessment. And then, you know, you can keep it public, you know, or unlisted to your students, you know, throughout the learning cycle. Now, teachers don't have to be the only ones creating videos because you can also have students create uh, a screencast showing their process for learning as they're applying and practicing the material. And you can put it at the end of the learning cycle with students creating a screencast of their final project and reflection to demonstrate mastery. So within the learning cycle, the video can fit anywhere and it can be teacher or student created. So one of the first videos that I highly recommend that you create for your classes is a flipped class expectations video. You want to utilize your, you know, pre-existing document that has your class expectations and um, create some questions that will check for understanding. If you load it into a tool like this, uh, Edpuzzle, it is fantastic because it will put checkpoints in where the video will pause, the questions will pop out, the students can answer the questions, and then the teacher can analyze that performance data. So this is a great one for not only students to view, but also your parents to view and understand. And even your administrators, if you're a teacher, that having all stakeholders view this video will ensure that folks understand the processes 
within your classroom space so that everyone can be successful. In terms of videos for direct instruction, uh, you can record a video using your preferred screencasting tool. You upload that video to YouTube or a cloud storage site. You can then attach that link to the video uh, to an Edmodo post. Students can view it and complete the tasks on paper. You know, if you don't want to do a, you know, extra ed tech tool step with it. And then to verify that students have completed their work, well, you can have the students snap a picture of their paper task and turn that image in attached to an Edmodo assignment. So you can verify uh, and document the learning that is happening. For flipped answer keys, uh, I do this where I'll create the video and then I will attach that video as part of an agenda post. Students can view the video and check their answers. And again, when it comes time for the summative assessment, I'll change the viewing permissions so they can't open that video up during the test and, you know, copy the answers from my answer key. You know, but this is great, you know, for students who are absent, um, you know, or just students who want to pause, rewind, and really double check their work, that they can do this, you know, with a flipped answer key video. Now, in terms of students creating their own videos, I highly recommend using Screencastify, um, having students add that to their Chrome profile uh, because it makes it so easy to save to Google Drive and then they can share that link um, attached to a post, uh, turn it in as an assignment, etc. And, you know, students can uh, post their videos for feedback and this is really important for building that sense of community and learning culture. So in this case, Ethan here has recorded a screencast of a project he was working on and he's in mid project. So in the middle of the learning cycle, Ethan's talking about what his intentions are for this project and what he's trying to create. And then Sarah here has replied with a great amount of narrative feedback, you know, to give him uh, some ideas to continue the learning that's happening and to hopefully propel him to finishing his project. Now, and if us as teachers, you know, from a time standpoint, if we were to do this type of narrative feedback, you know, and if it takes a good, you know, five, 10 minutes per student and we have a hundred students, that's a lot of time. So the more that we can bring students into this experience of providing feedback to one another, the more it will free us teachers as the person who is the only voice in verifying the student's learning. So this is good to provide multiple feedback for them. Uh, if you're looking for additional resources, you know, let's say you're not great in making your own videos, you can search, certainly search for content to use. Uh, within Edmodo, we have the Discover area, which provides um, resources shared by teachers that we have the most popular videos, we have collections of resources that we've curated for teachers, and we even have games um, that, you know, students want to play as a brain break. They can do this all within the Discover area of Edmodo. Okay, so we're getting close to the end of the flipped learning pillars here. We have one pillar left with the P of professional educator. And so in this part of the flipped learning definition, we want to look at how the educator guides students as part of this learning process. So for being a professional educator, we want to observe and facilitate the learning that's happening during class. We want to provide students with relevant feedback. We want to be reflective in our own practice, as well as strive for the growth of our students and ourselves. And we want to be connected to a greater educational community. So when we're providing feedback for students, let's say in a, in a Moto assignment like we see here, we can do comments down here at the bottom, um, you know, and have that one on one personal conversation with students, whether it's in a textual format or video or, you know, in person conversation, we can keep the learning happening. Edmodo assignments are great because they are teacher created and they're open ended. You can um, load new or existing assignments. Um, you can send them to individuals, small groups or whole classes. So you can differentiate your instruction. You can attach links and viewable, editable Google and Word documents. 
Uh, students can upload files, they can attach them from their Edmodo backpack or their links from their um, connected Google or Office drives. And teachers can be flexible with setting due dates and locking assignments after the due date or even changing the due dates. There's a lot of flexibility there. And to help support student efficacy, you can see here in this screenshot, 15 of your students haven't viewed the assignment. You can send them a direct message and help them be um, more successful in completing their work and that they're staying on task. Edmodo quizzes are created by the teacher but can be graded by Edmodo because we have some auto graded question types of multiple choice, fill in the blank, matching, true, false, and multi-select. So the auto grading is great to provide students with quick actionable feedback on their performance. Uh, your grades are automatically added to the progress area of Edmodo, so you can track the whole class and analyze that data. Um, you can send these to individuals or groups, small groups and classes. Uh, you can view this data and you can use quizzes as a replacement for paper worksheets um, as an individual or group check for understanding. You can do a group activity. Uh, you can use it as an actual quiz for a unit checkpoint and I've even used Edmodo quizzes for the multiple choice portion of my final exam. They're really a versatile tool that you can use um, to help support the learning of your students and save you time grading. I, as a teacher, will never grade a multiple choice, true, false, multi-select test quiz ever by hand ever again because we have tools that we can leverage to do that work for us. Now, also in Edmodo, we can do some uh, gamification. We can um, gamify our quizzes with jumpstart activities. So this is integration within Edmodo. You can directly link your Edmodo classes and quickly find and create interact activities that you can send to them. Uh, you can select from pre-made activities real quick. Everything's auto graded um, except for short answers. You can um, have the feedback sent directly to students. And again, send to individuals or groups or whole classes. Everyone can see the data and you can use this as a replacement for paper worksheets and other checks for understanding. It's really another versatile tool to use as well. And also being part of the flipped learning uh, community on Edmodo, we have the flipped classroom hashtag and you can go to Edmodo and explore hashtags, search for flipped learning and flipped classroom, and then hit the follow button to connect with, in this case, 80,000 other educators who are interested in this topic. And then you can post another one another, one another and stay connected to that greater community. So to wrap up Edmodo and flipped learning, you wanna think about how to create that PLN experience for your students for both synchronous and asynchronous learning. You wanna utilize flipped and blended learning by combining paper and digital tools to support the efficacy and executive functioning. But ultimately, you really wanna nurture the relationships that are occurring. Provide opportunities for interactions and tasks that can nurture relationships, metacognition, and personal growth for both you and your students. So I hope this video has um, provided you with a lot more information about flipped learning. If you're interested to learn more, you can go visit the Flipped Learning Network at flippedlearning.org. And if you're interested in all the things that Edmodo can do for you and your students and staff, you can visit go.edmodo.com forward slash schools. So thank you everyone and Hopefully continue the learning.